this, um, as I always do. It just, it just flowed and was so beautiful. Then I started making notes. Mm -hmm. Making notes is really bad. <laughs> you know, it's much better just to, to stay with it, I think. Okay, uh, Stanley Kubrick said, truth and multifaceted ideas do not yield themselves to frontal assault. And neither does Terrence Malick. So this is gonna be an, an analogy an, an analogy laden uh, intro. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Now that's a rhyme and it has narrative purpose and it's an introduction, but more than anything else, it's an incantation because the collection of syllables, those hard consonants, and especially the rhythm, evoke emotions that have nothing to do with the words on the page. They go beyond it. Because double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, why should that fill you with dread? You don't have anything to do with the cauldron, but just the sounds. The sounds are incantations, and they produce this um, feeling of dread. And they also have this incredibly powerful rhythm. And as Rapound said, he who controls rhythm controls. He who controls rhythm controls, which is an exercise in rhythm itself. You can just hear the big waves rolling in from the ocean. He who controls rhythm controls. And so it came to pass that a good while back, I, I think I mentioned this to y'all, um, I was sitting in a movie theater in the little town of Haley, Idaho, which is 10 miles south of Sun Valley, that Bruce Willis had purchased and refurbished at considerable expense. He put a quarter million dollar sound system in, put a wine bar and love seats in the balcony. And I was sitting in this theater in Haley, Idaho, because Ezra Pound was born in Haley, Idaho, and Bruce Willis had brought Allen Ginsberg to this theater to read Ezra Pound. <laughs> I was not especially intrigued by Ezra Pound. I mean, the ironies were stacking up like JFK, like 747s over JFK. So that was a lot more intriguing, but I was ready to listen. Uh, but the trouble is, the tragedy is, you know, when it comes to the, the written word, I don't have a poetry head. I, I am a prose guy. And when it comes to poetry, I'm with Bob Dylan, who when asked in 1965 by an interviewer when he was blowing up worldwide, who is America's greatest living poet? Bob Dylan said, Smokey Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with Bob. So um, Ginsburg read Pound, and it was all right. And then Ginsburg began to read Ginsburg, and his poetry never spoke to me in any way in particular. But as he was reading, I began to have these profound emotional responses to what he was reading. And they were entirely physical. My, my stomach was turning over, my heart was aching, my heart was elated, I was almost crying. It, they, the poems took me over in a way that had nothing to do with, with what he was reading. I couldn't make any sense of that. So I pondered on it on some length and figured out that he had burrowed so deeply into the language that he had gone beyond the rational meaning and understood how to link the rational meaning to the incantory power of the sound. And he was essentially casting these emotional spells from the incantory power of the words he had chosen and their rhythm. And that's what Malik does. Malik is a master of the ineffable. And it's very difficult to look at Malik, put two shots together, and say, that's where this emotional resonance comes from. It's almost impossible to sort it out. He is presenting incantory cinema. And he's raising emotions from the incantory combination of the cinematic elements that he puts together. And, you know, two of the films we've seen so far are essentially prose. You know, um, Sorcerer, you could write Sorcerer on the page and get the experience of Sorcerer. I defy you to write the red shoes down on the page. Try and write, get moved from that. And when you look at Badlands, you're going to say, well, this script was 95, minutes long, 95 pages long and 90 of them were blank. <laughs> and you couldn't evoke what he evokes from the written word. This is pure cinema. And Malik is a pure cinematician, and the effects of it emerge purely from cinema. Now, um, Godard said, one plus one equals three. And by that he meant you put two things together, two people, two pieces of film, two notes, and the third thing emerges that is far greater than the sum of their parts. And this film is just a lesson in one plus one equals three. Now, uh, Mark Twain said that after studying people his entire life, as near as he could figure it, everyone had three lives. Their public life, their private life, and the life that went on in their head. And Twain said he could never figure out which one was either the more real or the truer to the character of the person. And Malick 
in every film delves into this dissonance or alignment between what a character thinks, does, and says. It, it fascinates him. And the spaces in between the dissonance or the alignment also fascinate him. Sissy Spacek is the unreliable narrator in this, and the dif distance between her words and her actions and her thoughts tell the whole story. Um, Thin Red Line, which was a $75 million art movie masquerading as a war picture, Malick cuts, in a way I've never seen a film cut, from one character's psychological state to the next. And somehow you know that's what he's cutting, and it, that's what motivates every cut, is the next character's psychological state. So that he, he burrows into cinema like nobody else, and he burrows just as deeply into um, character. Now, the evangelist uh, goes up on the mountaintop and comes back from the mountaintop and says to you, I have been to the mountaintop and I have seen this, and then the evangelist tells you about what he or she saw and what it meant and how she or he or she feels because the evangelist is determined that you're going to feel the way he or she does. And I say my whole career has been about evangelism, about film and music and getting people to love what I love and telling them why. The shaman or shamanist goes up on the mountain and comes back and doesn't say a mumbling word. And if you say to the shaman, uh, yo, Bob, I see that since you came down from the mountain, you moved your feather from the right side of your hat to the left side. What does that signify? The shaman would just look at you like adult, as if you were adult. Because the shaman goes up and is changed and comes back, and it's up to you to study the shaman and the shaman's action and discover how the shaman has changed and what you can then get from the shaman's experience. The shamans are gnomic. The shamans are Gnostic. You don't know what they know. You don't know what they're saying. And the, the diff between shamans and evangelists also has to do with embracing ambiguity, accepting ambiguity. Now, every director is either a shaman or an evangelist. And I used to believe it was either or, but as everything else in life, you learn it's on a continuum. And it's also one of the great bar arguments of all time. So the number one evangelist, the director most determined that you will feel only what he feels and nothing else, is, of course, Spielberg. He beats you over the head with what he feels all the time, and if that isn't enough, he brings in John Williams to punch you in the face <laughs> with what he thinks and feels. Ford is an evangelist. Kurosawa is an evangelist. Capra was an evangelist. Pretty much all tentpole directors, James Cameron, Catherine Bigelow, was an evangelist. I think Friedkin's an evangelist. Hawks is an evangelist. Scorsese, most of the time, is an evangelist. Uh, then you get the people in the middle that are really intriguing. Um, Coppola. You know, goes from either end of the continuum. Bergman, Powell and Pressburger of the Red Shoes, they're very much both at once. Hitchcock, Nicholas Winding Refn, those are evangelists. Now, the shaman. Uh, Godard is the king of the shaman. Obviously, you never know what Godard is on about, and he's not going to explain it to you. Uh, Joanna Hogg, who might be the best filmmaker in the world right now. Uh, Robert Bresson, Theodore Dreyer, Ozu, Chantel Ackerman, Antonioni, Leone, uh, Gia Jean Kay, the Thai director of Uncle Boon May, who can recall his past lives. I'm not going to venture on pronouncing his name, but he's a contemporary shaman. And Malik is completely a shaman. Um, shaman's films should always see, be seen big because they're dreamlike, they're immersive, they have strong narratives, but the narrative is never the point. And all these shaman, especially Malik, they leave meaning behind for a kind of aboutness. And you can't really define this aboutness but it always has an element of yearning. And so it's not so much what is all this about the, in a meaning sense, but where can it take you? What states of mind? So Paul Schrader, you know, who wrote Taxi Driver and um, Raging Bull and directed a number of films, and who wrote the definitive monograph on film noir, noir, has a very good book called Transcendent Cinema. And he examines Ozu and Dreyer and Bresson. And he talks about how these are all transcendents, as Malik is, and they seek to induce, evoke, incantate a state of transcendence in you. So that, in a sense, you do transcend meaning, and you go into this aboutness, whatever the aboutness embraces. And Schrader does a remarkable job. But he falls short when he tries to tie this transcendence to certain stylistic mannerisms, because this stuff resists rational parsing. It's, it's a world beyond words and beyond analysis. How would I describe to you a Rothko? How would I describe the wind? Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Bravo.
Thank you, Jeff.